Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it a minute or two to let everybody join in, and then we'll get started. All right, the numbers have stopped going. So um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Mary. I am Mary Myers. I'm the Director of Business Development at the Barriga County EDC. Um, uh, the EDC is holding this webinar in partnership with the Barriga Chamber of Commerce. And we'll be going over a very important topic, discussing changes about earn sick time and then the Workforce Opportunity Wage Act. These will be affecting a majority of businesses, so it's important for your business um, as an owner or an employee to know what the changes are and what you need to implement at your business before that February date. Just a quick note before I introduce our spe speakers, um, if you have questions, you can submit those through the question box throughout the webinar, and then we'll get to them at the end as time allows. So our presenters today, presenters today are Brian Sheridan and Peter. Peter, I should have asked how to pronounce your last name. I'm going to, I might butcher it, Skorowski? Sikorski. Sikorski, I'm sorry. Um, with Stewart and Sheridan. Brian is a partner at Stewart and Sheridan PLC located in Ishpeming. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan Law School. He specializes in real estate transaction, real estate litigation, bank representation, commercial transactions and litigation, creditor representation and bankruptcy, and other general civil matters and litigation. Peter is from Lons and a graduate of the University of North Carolina of Charlotte and the Georgia State University College of Law. He's a member of the State Bar of Georgia. He supports Mr. Sheridan and his practice in the areas of practice and um, what I previously mentioned. He also works closely with local charitable organizations and public interest groups, advising them on how to obtain their objectives. With that, thank you both for being here today, and I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Brian and Peter. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting us. I hope everyone can see and hear us. Um, we're going to give today a general overview of the Earned Sick Time Act and what's called the Improved Workforce Opportunity Wage Act. <clears throat> uh, a couple of cautionary notes. Uh, this is a very recent um, legal development that was passed by a referendum initially. It was amended by the legislature, there was some question if the legislature had the authority to do that. And the Supreme Court very recently uh, resolved that in their own fashion, uh, including changing some of the dates and deadlines and so on in the act. Uh, be that as it may, it's the law of the land right now. <clears throat> but because it's so new and so recently amended, um, there are still questions out there we can give you a general overview. We can try to answer general questions. Uh, if you have very fact-specific situations in your own business, uh, we would suggest, of course, consulting with your own legal counsel. So the two laws here passed by referendum we're talking about, one is the Earned Sick Time Act, and one is the so-called Improved Workforce Opportunity Wage Act. Um, these go into effect on February 21, 2025. So the case is called Mothering Justice versus Attorney General. Uh, what you see on your screen is a quotation from that case. Um, the legislature had the option when the referendum was passed of adopting that. And they adopted it, but changed it. And the Supreme Court has recently ruled they were not allowed to do that. So the original referendum language applies as amended by 
<clears throat> the Supreme Court because some of the dates were, were no longer applicable due to the long period of time this took to get through the court system. So we'll talk about what actually happened here legally. Um, I think the dissent, which is on your screen, pretty well explains uh, the dissenting position on that decision, uh, one which with which we happen to agree, but that's neither here nor there right now. Um, they, they use their judicial power to rewrite portions of the statutes in a complex area of law pertaining to employment relations, the tip services, uh, et cetera. These, <clears throat> most of these matters were not previously in the Michigan statutes. Obviously we had overtime statute. Um, we had separate provisions for tipped workers and so on, but this uh, case, has, has drastically revised those provisions, which, as I said, are effective September 21, February 21, 2025. So let's talk about the Earned Sick Time Act. It says all covered employers must amend existing paid leave policies or implement new leave policies that comply with this law by February 21, 2025. Uh, that date will be on us before we know it, so you are well advised to um, take heed about this act. Um, as you can see in the details, it applies to all employers. Uh, if there are collective bargaining agreements, not usually the case for small businesses, but those can exceed the requirements, otherwise they must comply. Um, paid vacation that you may offer can satisfy these requirements, but the employee can take this time off under sick time conditions, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Uh, you're not required to offer paid vacation time, but you are required to offer paid sick time. And that sick time will accrue at the rate of one hour for every 30 hours worked, 72 hours maximum in a given year, which will carry over from year to year if not used. Uh, the only exception to that rule is if you have fewer than 10 employees, only 40 hours needs to be paid time off. But we emphasize again, this applies to all employers, uh, even if you have one employee. Um, and you have to pay them a sick time, the normal hourly wage, meaning, as we say there, the average hourly rate of the employee in the pay period immediately prior to the pay period in which uh, the sick time was used. Uh, more details are on the next page. The employee must give seven days notice or as soon as practicable. This is one of the terms that hasn't been defined. Um, obviously, when people get sick, they don't always give seven days notice or are able to. But this is a situation where <clears throat> it appears to us at least the employee could call in that day, that morning, say, and say, I'm sick, I'm not coming in. And that's that. Uh, you can only, you, the employer, can only require documentation if the employee is out for three consecutive leave days. So first day, second day, are basically, I'm sick, I'm not coming in, that's it. Um, <clears throat> And the documentation that you can require, again, only after three consecutive days are taken, uh, is by any healthcare professional, which uh, can include, besides doctors, acupuncturists, massa massage therapists, and veterinarians. Uh, how your employee would bring a note from a veterinarian is not clear to us, but that's what the act says. Uh, <clears throat> And if you do request that sick time documentation from a medical professional, acupuncturist, et cetera, the employer is responsible for any expense in providing that documentation that the healthcare professional might charge. So basically uh, the employee, again, this time has to be earned as we set forth earlier, but they have up to 72 hours of intermittent no call or no show over the course of the year. Uh, 
So, more details. Employers must keep records of our work and sick time taken for three years afterwards. You cannot retaliate against employees for using this sick time or complaining about you, the employer, for potentially violating the act. Um, it creates what's called a private right of action, meaning the employee could sue the employer <clears throat> and possibly be entitled to reinstatement and attorney fees, back pay and benefits, which would be doubled upon prevailing. Uh, and they can do that within three years of the complaint of action. This is um, an invitation if you have a litigious employee to uh, really <clears throat> impede your business <clears throat> because they have this right to basically uh, say I'm not showing up, uh, the documentation requirements are very thin really from anybody including say a massage therapist that they can't work uh, you have to pay for that documentation and you cannot retaliate against them it's not our job as attorneys necessarily to say something is a good idea or a bad idea but uh, Peter and I represent a number of small employers our law firm is a small employer and it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see the abuse that could happen under this scheme uh, by someone who's determined to exploit every last minute of uh, time off and every last recourse they have against the employer uh, for any interference with that. I don't think there's any comprehension here on the part of what this would mean to a small employer to have people just not show up uh, when they're expected to show up and not even have to document that unless it's three consecutive days. They just have to say they're sick. Um, but that's what it is. So what can this be used for? Uh, not just the employee being sick, but employees, family members, mental or physical illness, injury, or health condition to be used for medical diagnosis, care, or treatment of the employee's mental or physical illness, injury, or health condition, or preventative medical care for the employee. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the employee who's sick. It can be a family member who's sick or claims to be sick. Um, If the employee or a family member is a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, uh, they can take time off to obtain legal services, participate in any civil or criminal proceedings relating to that domestic violence or sexual assault. So again, this is another aspect where the employee themselves is not sick, but they are alleged to be in this situation of assisting themselves or a family member to obtain legal services, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> can also be used for meetings at a child's school or a place of care, which would be daycare <clears throat> relating to child's health or disability or the effects of domestic violence or sexual assault on the child or foreclosure of the employee's place of business by order of a public official. This is a COVID type uh, situation, which would be out of control of the employer, of course. And you cannot require the employee to search for or secure a replacement worker as a condition for using earned sick time. So we talked uh, a little bit about family members. They, that is a broad definition. Biological adopted or foster child, stepchild, legal ward, a child to whom the employee stands local parentis, basically uh, acting as a parent, uh, includes a biological parent, foster parent, step parent, adopted parent, etc., or the employee spouse or domestic partner, <clears throat> uh, grandparent, grandchild, also biological foster and adopted siblings. So these are. Uh, 
very broad categories, and finally, any other individual related by blood or affinity whose close association with the employee is the equivalent of a family relationship. Uh, we're not sure what that means, <clears throat> actually. You could um, you could make that claim about a broad number of people and any of those persons who are in a health situation, domestic violence, et cetera, as we talked about, uh, would qualify as a family member under the act and the employee would be entitled to pay time off to take care of that situation. So that's a, that's a brief recap of the Sick Time Act, which I'm guessing will be a, require a major overhaul of most of your sick time policies, if you even have written sick time policies. Um, most small businesses, including ours here in Ishpeme, uh, rely on the good faith of the employees if they say they're sick or their child's sick. Um, we know them well enough to take that at face value. That will not necessarily be the case under this new act. And you cannot retaliate against them for using that. So um, I, I feel like this is sort of good luck if you have a litigious employee, someone who knows all the ins and outs of this law, intends to take advantage of it. Uh, they can make your life as a small employer very difficult. But that's what the law is or will be in February. So the other act is the Improved Workforce Opportunity and Wage Act, uh, which has gotten a lot of publicity lately. This is a bit more straightforward. Um, <clears throat> it affects the state minimum wage and the tip credit provisions of tipped employees although that is not completely eliminated until 2029. So the minimum hourly wage is set forth in the statute. And as you can see, beginning January 1, 2022 is $12, and then the state treasurer calculated the adjusted minimum wage rate um, by inflation. I'm gonna interrupt briefly here. So the Supreme Court case set the 20, February 21st, 2025 date as January 1st, 2029 for this purpose. So we're starting at $10 an hour, but they're actually gonna incorporate the inflation adjustment for all the years between then and now. Yeah, I think that's in the next slide, isn't it? it? Well, the the inflation language is right here, but yes, we've got the um, the number of that that'll actually be right here. So you see, the minimum wage is raised to twelve forty eight again, beginning in February twenty twenty five. Um, yeah, we can we can really only guess what it is after that, depending on inflation. But the tipped minimum wage for tipped employees is a major change in existing law. And that will rise to $5.99 per hour in February of 2025. <clears throat> and tipped employees are defined in the statute. Um, basically, yeah, when we think of restaurant people, that's, that's basically true. Uh, they receive gratuities in the course of their employment. Um, and they are allowed to uh, retain them, except as voluntarily shared with other employees. So part of the chain of service, this, again, is a restaurant, uh, you know, front of house, back of house type situation. Um, this will be a major change, not sliding into place completely for several years, but eventually culminating in there being no credit for tipped employees in 2029. So you can see in the chart that Peter put together there, the, the tipped minimum wage 
key to the minimum wage itself, which is a key to inflation. So the tip minimum wage goes up year after year until 2029, uh, tip credits are prohibited. This doesn't mean that the person, the server can't get tipped, for example, but it means that they have to be paid minimum wage. And Peter and I have discussed uh, how much of a tip for people leave in a restaurant if they know the server is being paid $15 an hour. <clears throat> Maybe not much, but we'll have to see how that plays out. So basically, leading up to 2029, <clears throat> uh, they will be treated as a regular employee who's just working X number of hours at X minimum wage. Any tips they get are on top of that. We, we do anticipate, just as a matter of course, this will result in reduction of tips because those higher minimum wage payments will almost surely be reflected in the cost of the service, goods and services provided. So um, that's what the law says. That's what we're stuck with now. So uh, that category you need to be aware of if you are in a business that has tipped employees. So um, this has been a very brief overview. Uh, uh, this explains, as we said at the outset, that the citizens of Michigan uh, did retrieve enough signatures for a ballot initiative, uh, was not put to a vote. The legislature adopted it, which is an option the way the state constitution is written. Uh, it was then amended by the legislature and the Supreme Court said the legislature did not have the authority to do that. Uh, they could either adopt the amendment or put it to a, a statewide vote. Um, so now we have the laws that we're talking about. And, you know, we added a couple, I guess semi uh, facetious remarks at the end about uh, tipping and abuse of sick time, which with the right employee, or I should say the wrong employee, um, will probably be pretty prevalent and will create a pretty miserable workplace experience for the employer uh, once people figure out how they can use this system or in some cases game the system. Um, but we'll have to see. Now, it is likely that <clears throat> the Department of Labor or some other Michigan agency will issue administrative rules interpreting this that has not happened yet. So all we have is the bare language of the statutes as amended by the Michigan Supreme Court. So there are a lot of questions. Uh, you know, we're in October, we have just a few months before this uh, goes into effect. And at this point, we don't see any legal means by which this will not go into effect because it was a uh, Supreme Court decision. The Supreme Court is unlikely to reverse itself in the next few months, so this will be the law of the land. Uh, for how long, we don't know. It could still be amended down the road by some mechanism, but uh, it's not amended right now, and the brief overview we've given you is, is what the law will be in February of 2025, and as a small employer, again, any employer with employees, um, you, you had better be ready for it because people will be looking over your shoulder. I, I'd like to add that, um, you know, if we look at the way this happened, so there was a ballot initiative petition, signatures were gathered. And then at that point, the legislature could either adopt the language of the ballot initiative as law or put it to a vote. And, neat, and so instead of putting it to a vote to see if, the people of the state of Michigan wanted this, they adopted it and then changed it and understand why the Supreme Court said that that act was illegal. But the remedy probably should have been, okay, legislature, you can either adopt this or put it to a vote. Just like go back to the, the first step, which is, you know, adopt it as is or let the citizens of the voters of the state of Michigan decide whether to accept it or not. And that's not what happened. I mean, what happened is, is that this law like squeaked through in a very undemocratic way. The only like 
real influence that the people of the state of Michigan had was to sign a petition and the legislature itself was basically overridden because they wanted something like it, but something different and they didn't get what they want either. So now we have this and, and it just, you know, hopefully over time, the legislature will revisit some of these issues and clarify some of these issues or maybe back off some of these issues. But right now, what we have is something that's going to be fairly difficult to deal with under some, some circumstances with some employees. Right. So this was never actually voted on by the people of the state of Michigan. They had enough signatures to have a vote, and the legislature took over at that point, as I said at the outset, um, which is an option under the state constitution, but they they changed the referendum language in the statute, and the Supreme Court has just said that that was not allowable. So the original referendum stands, even though it was never voted on. So you can argue that's good law or bad law. I guess it's pretty clear where we stand, but that is the law and that is binding on you as an employer. All right, thank you so much. Um, now is the time, if you haven't, and you have any questions that you wanna get submitted to please send those over in the chat or the question box. There aren't any in there, but I have a couple lined up for both of you. Um, so salary thresholds, can you touch a little bit on that? Because those are some things that are also changing um, with the federal act. Um, I know that some of those thresholds are jumping quite a bit um, that will also affect a lot of nonprofit organizations specifically um, and those smaller businesses. Do you know, I can't, I want to say it's jumping from like 43,000 to 58,000. I might be, yeah. I might be, <laughs> if you don't have the answer, that's completely fine. So I'm just. <laughs> no, we haven't teed up on that aspect of it. I, I know those changes have been made. Um, this uh, act obviously <clears throat> is key towards hourly employees. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, it talks about hourly wages, although those can be computed if the uh, person is salaried. Mm -hmm. Um but no, I, I don't have an answer for that, Mary, off the top That's of my head. totally fine. But, so, but yeah. something that businesses should also look at, too, if you have a salary, if you have salary employees. It, it's going from 43,888 this year, and in January, it's going to be 58,656 for exempt employees. Yep. So if yeah. you have employees that are under that 58,000 threshold, they need to be paid time and a half now. So something else to consider. I know that there's a, our organization will be experiencing that. Um, there's several others. I mean, I can't, a majority will be um, experiencing that. Um, another question that I had, um, if you, if you have an existing, um, cause this is something that I've been getting asked a lot with small businesses, say you have an existing PTO plan and it encompasses all PTO, sick time, general PTO, and you offer maybe, you over offer what's above the threshold. Those, from what I've understood, businesses will have to separate the sick time out and account for what that is actually being used for sick time still under this law. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. You, you, will, you will have to split that off as a separate benefit. Uh, you'll have to keep track of that separately in terms of how much the employee earns paid sick time and how much uh, the employee actually uses and you have to keep those records for three years. So the PTO policy, which is a good one when we've used ourselves because you know the employee has X number of days. If they, they're sick, they can use one of those days. If they're going to Jamaica, they can use one of those days, but um, that's not the case now. Of course, you can still give pay time off, vacation time, whatever you want to call it. But the sick time is to be segregated uh, in terms of its availability for the employee and its use by the employee. You have to be able to show that you're giving them the legal minimum. 
and you have to keep track of that like the if you do like two weeks off a year like that's fine but it has to it has to be usable like this paid time off and you still have to chart the hours worked and the and the sick time used and things like that comply with the reporting requirement perfect um we have a question so and i believe the answer is yes you can front load sick time rather than occurring it right so they don't you just have to they have to have that minimum amount of whatever is required in the law so for instance the law says that they have to certain people have to get or businesses have to offer 72 hours of of sick time every hour i think is what it is if you want to front load that and just give it all to them in january for them to use that's fine right cuz you're over doing what the law states yes yeah. but you still have to keep track of it okay you, you still have to like if if they are accumulating sick time or if they want to carry it over to the next year mm -hmm. like that that still has to be part yeah. of it because like those are all the the legal minimums now okay um, right and it, it needs to be documented um what what you've offered and what they use and what they don't use as peter said carries over um uh, into the next year and the next year and so on okay perfect so yes you can front load sick time as long as it's documented how it's used. Um, I don't know the answer to this. How does this affect high school minimum wage? Would that depend on, I'm guessing that would depend on if they're in a union or not, um, and then what their salary threshold is? Yeah, high school minimum wage, did you say? Yeah, the question is how does this affect high school minimum wage? But I'm guessing that it depends on a few things. Yeah, I'm. Uh, there's no carve out that we saw in the act for uh, for that. It, it just applies for, to all employers, all employees. I don't know. Can you bring that up, Peter, quickly? Yeah, the training wage of four twenty five per hour for newly hired employees under the age of twenty for the first ninety calendar days remains unchanged, but then they would then they would be entitled to minimum wage. Okay. Um, here's a really good question. If they carry over sick time that's unused, do they end up occurring more than the minimum? So for instance, if you get 72 hours, say you don't use any in that first year, do they get another 72 hours the next year or does it stay at that 72 hour threshold? No, they, they would get another 72 hours if they earn it. Okay. Um, I want to add to the high school question. Minors under the age of 18 are going to be paid 85% of the minimum hourly wage for adults. Perfect. Yeah. Um, one question that I've also been asked, and I know that this is where some of the vagueness comes in with the way that the law is written currently. How do con independent contractors come into this. If I have somebody who's cleaning my office building, for instance, that's an independent contractor, do they have to be offered PTO? No. It only applies to employees. Now, <clears throat> that's a sticky issue we've run into over the years for a number of reasons. Uh, people want to say that someone working for them is an independent contractor. The IRS says like a 17-part test of who's an independent contractor. So, if I hire someone as I have done to paint my house, you know, or or do some uh, plumbing work or renovation work, that's that's a contract. That person's an independent contractor. I'm not I'm not setting their hours and not telling them how to do their job. Uh, they're using their own tools and equipment, their own expertise, and so on. So they are independent contractors. They are not covered by this law. There are some gray areas there, and you need to be careful about that because not only is it possible that the person could be considered an employee for the purpose of this law, but, um, you know, the IRS could come after you for, um, you know, withholding employee side social security, that sort of thing. We've seen that happen. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's usually pretty clear if a person's an independent contractor or not, 
uh, a cleaning employee could be that because you're not supervising them. They come on their own time. You're not setting their hours. Um, but you need to be very careful about that. And you, I would not advise anyone to try to circumvent this act by calling someone an independent contractor that comes to their workplace every day, you know, sits down and works under their direct supervision that will not qualify, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, can you implement dis disciplinary actions if they go over their, the allotted amount that the law requires for sick time? So if you're required as a business owner to provide 72 hours and they use 40 or if they use 80, are you allowed to um, use disciplinary action against that? Yeah, well, you're not retaliating against them for their using their rights under this act because they don't they've exhausted those rights. Um, sometimes we run into issues with the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, reasonable accommodations, and so on. Uh, would depend a lot on the specific fact situation, but they're not entitled to indefinite sick time under this act. Um, whether whether they might have a claim under the ADA or some other law would be a pretty fact specific question, but they, they would not be covered under this. You don't have to give them more than seventy two hours paid time off. Uh, All right, perfect. Um, I think I know the answer to this one, but is there a cap on what they can occur? So as I mentioned, say that they don't use their 72 hours the first year, the second year, the third year, it continues to carry over, correct? Until they use it, there's no cap on it? That's correct. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure about the answer to that question, actually. Okay. I don't know if it continues to accrue or... Um, what what the cap is i'd have to i'd have to look into that okay yeah i, I didn't see a cap but it's possible yeah. there is one um from I what i it... have heard there's no cap but that might be one of those vague things that's not included in the law right now well if you have an employee that goes two or three years without taking a sick day <laughs> yeah you're pretty lucky yeah <laughs> Yeah, but they might not be still deserving a month of paid vacation. <laughs> yeah. Um, if they, I will add one thing, if, uh, I believe this is in the act. Um, if if they terminate their employment and they have accrued sick time, that does not need to be paid. Is that your understanding, Peter? Yeah, that that's true. That I mean, other benefits may need to be paid, but this one. This is not not that. Okay. Um, I think that is. Oh, let's see. Do we have any? Does sick time have a cash bill value? Can you? Um, so I'm guessing where this is going. That if you don't want them to carry the seventy two hours over, if they don't use it, can you pay them out for that for the year? Um, that's not what that's not addressed in the act, as far as I know. It all all that's addressed is whether or not it's um, payable upon termination or separation, and it, and it is not. Um, whether or not you can like waive the employer's obligation to pay you for the sick time is is not something that we know at this point. Um. Let's see here. I think that we have answered all of the questions. So if you want to go to that last slide. Um, I appreciate both you, Brian and Peter, for participating in, in this um, Q&A session and providing this information. If you do have additional questions, a link to their website is here. Um, and you are more than welcome to reach out to them for some legal advice. We did record this webinar as well, so if you want to come back and reference it at a later time, it will be made available on our website. But um, with that, I will let everybody go. And again, thank you, Brian and Peter. I hope you all have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank our you. pleasure. Yep.